Hello, it's part two of the robot arm, which is going to be force driven, which means we can actively back drive it to train it. And also it can work out how much force is being exerted. So last time we made our two force driven joints. Those are basically the hubs for the two joints. We also made this big welded steel stand with some 3D printed uh, mounts on there to hold two plates so we can mount this on here. And that seems straightforward enough. But before we do that, we need to look at the motors we're going to use so we can work out how that plate design works. Just a quick ad for my Patreon. Don't forget you can support my channel on Patreon. And if you don't like Patreon, you can support it through YouTube channel membership. Just click on that join button below and the link to Patreon is in the description to this video. And you can get access to some exclusive rewards, including a live stream with me, all my videos early and lots of sneak peeks and pictures and interaction with me. Also, don't forget my merchandise store, which is Teespring, and the link is in the description to this video for t-shirts, bags, socks, and lots of other stuff. So these are the motors we discussed last time. This is a DC motor with a gear head on it, and this is a brushless motor. So this is a Turning G 6374, one of the SK3 ranges, the 149 kV motor. And to drive that though, we need the O-Drive, which will drive two brushless motors with encoders. This will go up to two kilowatts of basically 50 volts at 50 amps or thereabouts and we can drive it very accurately with an encoder on the back with 8,192 counts per revolution, and we can drive that two motors from the O-Drive, and that's what I'm using in OpenDog. In fact, there's 12 of these and six of these. However, we're probably gonna need some gearing. It is quite powerful, but to put that straight on there with a gear on each one, we do need probably an intermediate stage to get the torque we need. So instead of doing that, I'm actually gonna save the trouble almost and use this DC motor. So this is a motor from Gimson Robotics in the UK. It's only 35 watts continuous, not 2000. And that's, I guess, why brushless motors are more efficient for their size. It does have gearing already. And I don't think we need to apply that much torque. We just need to move it slowly and under control because all the axis are, of course, vertical. So it's not lifting anything against gravity. So I'm gonna try and use this motor. There is unfortunately no encoder on the back. So the first thing we've got to do is fit an encoder so that we can drive it accurately with an Arduino. So we're gonna try and fit an encoder on the back of this motor. So there's only a tiny stump there to put the encoder on. Unfortunately, that shaft that's actually attached to the motor that spins fast on the far side of the gearbox isn't very long, but in this case, it's actually gonna help us. So I bought several encoders. I bought these ones that you may have seen, which is 300 counts per revolution. That's a quadrature encoder, so we can work out which direction it's going. And we could try and put that on the back, but from experience, 300 counts per revolution of the speed this motor turns is probably actually too fast for a normal 16 megahertz 8-bit Arduino to read. So we could, of course, put it on that side, but then we only get 300 counts on this end. So this is a 71.2 to one ratio gearbox. So actually putting something like a 40 CPR encoder on the back is gonna be better than 300 on the front because it'd be 40 times 70, which is far higher resolution. So I've got these, which I found, which are Fidget's ENC4109 underscore zero encoders. These were only about seven pounds, I think, each. And um, that's what we're gonna try and use. So let's just open this up. Right, so we've got a little cable and we've got the actual encoder is in this little pot. So let's have a closer look at that. So there's um, some case parts. There's a thing there, which is basically the slotted disc. And then there's a sensor with a photodiode and what appears to be an LED of some sort and the connector. And that goes on the back of the motor mounted inside its little housing. And then the slotted disc rotates and this should be an quadrature encoder, hopefully, that gives us rising and falling, two phases of rising and falling data so we can work out which way it turns. Um, there is absolutely no documentation though because these were intended to connect to a fidgets board, which is USB. So there's no documentation as to what the pinouts are. There's about five pins on there. So we're gonna have to do some guesswork to work out where the two phases are and where power is. So I've basically connected this up to an Arduino Mega. Interestingly enough, the red and black wires, as you imagine, are the power. It seems to work on 3.3 or five volts. It's on five volts at the moment. And I found brown and white wires in that connector um, seem to be the two phases. There's also a green wire that just stays high all the time. Not sure what that is, and we'll probably never know unless we analyze it further somehow, but I'm not gonna do that right now. So I've got a very simple sketch here that just basically reads those two digitals and puts them out to the serial port so we can see the phases. So let's just open a serial monitor. Obviously the top's off and I haven't got the disc on, so they're both one. But if I go and put that disc on and turn it, we should be to see those phases. 
changing one after the other. And obviously if I move it the other way, they do it the other way round. So that's pretty positive. Those look like our two quadrature encoder phases. So now I've done another sketch, which I've got from the Arduino Playground, which is basically how to read encoders with interrupts. And I've now got two interrupts connected. So pins two and three are the interrupt pins. There's six actually on the Arduino Mega. And I've got in my loop, not very much, just writing out the encoder position to the serial terminal. But there's two functions, one for doing encoder A and one for doing encoder B, which count which one of those phases gets hit first, followed by the other one. And in some cases, it increments the count by one. And in some cases, it decrements it. So now we can go and look in our serial terminal. And we should have a position. So if I go and put that cat back on and rotate it, we should find if I rotate it one way, the number gets smaller. And if I rotate it the other way, the number gets bigger. So that seems to be working perfectly. So now we just need to mount this somehow on that massive motor stump. And you'll notice the hole in this disc is actually quite small. So now somehow I've got to mount the encoder on the back there. So um, fortunately, the little hole in there actually fits on with a bit of space to spare. So there is a mounting this comes with, the little housing that I can just glue on the back of the motor. Then we've got no problem mounting the board, but the problem we have got is mounting the slotted disc on that massive shaft. And it doesn't quite touch it actually. So I was gonna try and drill a hole in the back of this motor shaft, which is gonna be quite tricky to do, I think, and put a bolt in. But I think what I'm gonna do is just put a spacer on try and glue this straight on the back and see how that goes. So I've just glued an M3 nut and two M3 washers on the back and that seems to be about the right spacing and I'm just going to glue that on the back of the motor shaft. It never comes under any mechanical load and there is a little cap that goes over the whole thing so hopefully that'll be fine. So now I've got my motor attached to the encoder. It looks like a pretty neat job. I don't think that disc is ever gonna touch anything, so it should stay glued on there as long as I don't drop the motor or anything like that. So pretty happy with that. And now we can see our encoder count. And if I go and uh, run the motor, we should be able to see the encoder count counting up there. And if we go and reverse the polarity, we should find the motor runs the other way, of course and the encoder counts all the way back down and it counts all the way through zero and all the way to a negative number. So it looks like it's counting all the counts, the numbers are in the right order. If it were too fast to count then we find we miss some steps and it would do random things and shoot to 50 million but as it is it looks like it's running okay. So I've printed these gears, we've got one of these that fits on the hub on the robot arm and obviously a small one that goes on the motor. The one on the motor has a captive nut and also a grub screw so that should fit onto the flat on the shaft and that should run nicely on the ring. So that should push right on there, it's quite a tight fit and we'll glue it on of course. So that gear turns the whole hub and of course the inside rotates independently so we can work out the force. So now it's time to mount the motor and mount the bearings top and bottom. So it's time to cut out these metal plates we designed at the very start. So uh, basically I need to mount the motor so that we can get that gear meshing correct. So I've designed a little plate that's going to allow the motor to move and it moves in a channel on the bottom. And then we can tighten it down with a bolt in each corner when we've got it in the right place. And that means we can just get that gear meshing exactly correct to make it tight, but not too tight. Because trying to do it uh, so it's fixed is going to be quite tricky to do. So I've made it adjustable. So let's cut out those plates and get everything mounted. So I'm using Vectric Aspire to plan my tool paths because it's very easy. Haven't quite got into the Fusion 360 cam stuff yet. So these are my vectors in a 2D layout and in a 3D layout once I've set all the parameters. I can then go and actually run a simulation and see what it's going to do to the metal in the end. So these are all my passes being made and the holes being drilled. And those are all separate tool paths that I'll run once at a time.
So a bit of manual cleanup on these. I've actually sanded the top surfaces to give them that brushed effect to deburr some stuff. I got some of my speeds and feeds wrong, so basically some of the edges weren't that clean because they're a bit melty. But there we go, that's good enough. So this is my pivoting motor mount, which is gonna do that on this channel here between this point. So that means I can get that fine tuning on the gear meshing. And I've also got these pieces in the corners, you'll notice, where it clamps onto the big square shaft. And that's so that clamp, which we'll have a look at in a minute, can actually get bigger and smaller and one of the bolts can slide or it won't be to grip the stand. So we've got our first clamp and of course we've got that slot in the plate so this piece can still do up fine, so that's all good. We've got the plate attached to it which is bolted through with two M6 bolts. We've got the bearing fitted and we've got the motor there which of course can pivot till we do these nuts up on either side and then we can get that gear to mesh properly. So this is all mounted up now with the plates top and bottom and we can see that that's a fairly rigid assembly. There's a bit of flex in my stand and we can also see that of course the motor will turn this whole hub but the internal part of this will rotate independently and as the springs stretch we can work out the force applied to the arm and even without power that gearbox is strong enough to hold the motor in place. We may need to make it a bit stiffer as time goes on but we'll see how that goes and what we're actually going to measure is the absolute position of the arm which is this shaft rotating which is attached to the internal hub so that'll be able to accurately tell us where the arm is and we'll also be able to work out the difference between the actual arm position and the expected motor position so we can calculate the force. Just like a bit of tape on there so you can see as I move the internal hub of that thing rotates and of course that is actually attached to the arm so that's going to tell us the absolute position of where the arm actually is. So we've got a couple of minor issues basically these fingers don't quite grip the 2020 properly so they lock against this orange part in the middle so they lock to something, but that's bigger than the 2020. So I either need to shim them out or sand down the orange piece to make that nice and tight and probably apply some more springs at some point. And also we've got a tiny amount of backlash in that gearbox. But of course we are gonna measure the absolute position of the actual arm using that center shaft. So that should give us an accurate result as to where the arm actually is. So sitting on the table behind here now is an Arduino Mega that's reading that encoder position we started with at the beginning and also a motor driver and a battery which is gonna drive the motor. So now we can run a PID controller to move the motor against its encoder position. So I've now included the PID library in my code, which um, is set up at the top here. So we're running the loop every 20 milliseconds using a timer and we're allowing uh, maximum limits of minus and plus 255, which is the most you can write to the PWM pins on the mega. So the input for our PID controller is the encoder position. And the set point is reading from the serial terminal so I can type in numbers and it will go to that position. And then obviously the PID gets computed and that gives us an output which decides which way to turn the motor. Now I am filtering that output as well with the first order filter which basically smooths out the sharp lines so it will decelerate as it gets to its target. And then we're basically writing out the PWM pins and deciding which way to turn the motor. Obviously if the output is zero then we stop the motor and then we've reached our position hopefully. So I've put in some arbitrary PID values it could probably do with tuning a bit more. I've messed around with it quite a bit as well as that filter value which is currently set to 28 and that seems to give me quite a good response. So now if we open up our serial monitor we can see everything set to zero and I'm putting some of the results out here. So the first one is the encoder value, the second one is the actual output of the PID controller and the third one is that that value filtered. So if we now type in um, some numbers, we'll send it to encoder position 5000. We should see that arm rotate round and we can see we've actually hit 5016, which is pretty accurate. Bearing in mind that the encoder is a 40 CPR encoder on the motor side. And then we've got that 71 point whatever to one ratio gearbox. So in fact, um, 40 count out would be only a 70th of the rotation on the gear end and that's geared down again to the big gear on the hub. So we did have a little value here of minus 6.8 that was still trying to drive the motor but that's got filtered out to zero by the filter. If we took the filter away probably that isn't enough um, power to actually drive the motor so the motor would sit there buzzing and it would never get to its position. So let's move it on a little bit more to 10,000 and we can see here we've got 10,010 encoder counts so pretty accurate. Let's go all the way back with a bigger move to minus 10,000. And yeah, almost there. You can maybe hear the motor buzzing slightly. We haven't quite got to the position there. Let's go back to zero. Yep, and we're within 20 encoder counts. So that seems to be pretty accurate, and I think that's quite workable. So obviously we do have that little bit of wobble to solve, which is just that little gap 
which is making the arm wobble and we probably do need to stiffen up the springs because of this sort of thing on this end but we won't know by how much until we've put the forearm on and of course the other motor that drives this hub so we're going to deal with that next time and obviously we need to put the absolute position encoders on the two shafts as well so that we can actually read the absolute position of the arm and we can train the arm by back driving it so it knows we're pushing it back with some force or it can measure force if it collides with something but if we push it backwards then it'll know we're turning this it can work out the difference between where the motor should be and where the arm is and it can actively back drive it or it could actually apply more force so that's going to be a great way to train the arm to go to specific positions so that's the end of this episode don't forget to check back next time when i'm going to build the forearm that goes on here of course with the other motor and also set up for a linear slider which is basically going to have the grip on so it can go up and down to reach down to get things and then we can move in any sort of 3D space up and down and all around with those axes. We're also gonna try and put that feedback on, the absolute position feedback, and try and do some force driven moves. So don't forget to subscribe for more updates on this project and like the video if you like it. All right, that's all for now.